Open your Bibles for the first time or again to Psalm 113, which we read at the beginning of our service, please. Psalm 113. Many of us have been reading about God's will for our worship in the last week, and we'll talk about it some more in our discussion groups tonight. But here's a good psalm to remind us of who we worship and why we worship. Rick was so kind as to offer me a cough drop two songs ago, and it's helpful and appreciated, but I had only prepared to have words in my mouth with this sermon, so if there's some kind of mouth malfunction up here, I hope it is just this cough drop in a little while. We won't read the whole psalm again since we already have, but look at the first verse. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Human beings are worshipful creatures in a way different from any of the other creatures in all of creation. Now, there are some animals that might do something that looks almost like worship of you. Uh, Not your cat. Your cat's never worshipful of you. But many of you have a dog who's just so loyal to you and and just seems like you mean everything to him or to her. But there's something different in you. There's something more about you. You have the ability to reason about your object of devotion. You have the ability to think and to decide and to determine This is what I'm going to do, or this is what I'm not going to do. Every human being has a worshipful inclination. Not everybody follows it in the right direction. But God put it in us to point us toward Him. The psalmist says, praise the Lord. All of the psalms give us words with which to worship. And the one whom we ought always to worship, and the one whom we only should worship, is the Lord. The Lord. Jehovah in some of our translations, Yahweh. But he's identified as as different from anybody else we know, anyone else we might imagine, anything that we might think would deserve our praise the way that only he does. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Bible commentator Derek Kidner said there's a point in specifying the Lord's servants here and the Lord's name, since worship to be acceptable must be more than flattery and more than guesswork. It's the loving homage, he said, of the committed to the revealed. Now, slow down with that. Our worship should be more than flattery. We should be the Lord's servants. We shouldn't be a people who just get together and when other people are worshiping, well, that's what they're doing, that's what I'll do. No, we worship the Lord because we are servants of the Lord. And Kinder said it shouldn't be just guesswork. If we know the Lord, that means we know what He says about Himself and what He says about us and about how we will relate to Him in the right way. As He says, it's the loving homage of the committed, the servants, to the revealed, the Lord. And when He says the revealed, He's thinking about the name of the Lord. Often you'll read that in the Psalms and and elsewhere in Scripture. Praise the name of the Lord, it will say after it says, praise the Lord. Why is that? The name of the Lord in Scripture is another way to think of His character. (coughs) Excuse me. Another way to think of His character. His DNA. Our God is the Lord. He's the one who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush as the great I Am. 
about whom we just sang. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. What kind of God is He? Well, the Lord we read in in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, is love. God is love. We read in Scripture again and again that God is just. God is compassionate. God is merciful. Our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. All these things and more compose the character of God and show Him to us to be one who deserves worship like no one else does. We worship Him because He is the Lord. His name says so. He's worthy of it. Psalm 18, verse 3 says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. In the book of Revelation, we find the inhabitants of heaven offering praise to the Lord with words like these. Revelation chapter 4, verse 12. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? They say, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. He's the only creator God. He's the only one who could bring all of this into existence and sustain it and cause it all to be wrapped up whenever he's ready for the commencement of eternity as we will know it. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And then verses 2 and 3 in our psalm say, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. When does he deserve to be praised? When should he be worshipped? From this time forth and evermore. He always deserves it. And where should he be worshipped? Verse 3, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. That is from east to west. When we read scripture, we find that the Israelites were planted in in the middle of a world where people worshipped all kinds of gods that they had imagined. They were regional, and they were only the god of this or, or the god of that. But God gave Moses this message to spread through the Israelites and then on into the New Testament in Christ and and through his apostles and prophets and, and, and through us that he's the only God. He's God over all. And he's God everywhere. He always deserves to be praised and everywhere he deserves to be praised. Verse 4 says, The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? says verse 5. Some people don't understand what the Bible is calling upon us to do when it calls upon us to worship God. And they don't pause to think long enough and they don't look hard enough at Scripture to realize why God really ought to be worshipped. To them, God is the worst narcissist there has ever been. And there's such an epidemic of narcissism in the world. But it's something wrong with a God who must be told over and over how great he is, some atheists will ask. Is he like the evil queen in in Snow White who's making us the dutiful mirror? Who's the fairest one of them all? You are the fairest one of them all, God. It is true, as Jesus said in John 4, verse 23, that God seeks true worshipers. But the truth is, God doesn't need our worship. We need to worship Him. And as we see in the rest of this psalm, it's how we keep things straight. It's kind of like guys getting up this morning and and wherever you started with the buttons on your shirt, maybe on Sundays, unlike other days, you start all the way up here. But on the other days, you usually mean to start about right here. And you go through 
six or seven buttons, and sometimes you get to the end and you find out you didn't start in the right place. And so you've got to start all over again. Whenever we come together to worship God on the first day of the week, it's like getting that first button into the right hole so that all the rest of the days of this week will go the way that they're supposed to go, that we'll be thinking the way that we're supposed to think, and we'll be acting the way that we're supposed to act because we see God in the right place when we worship. This psalm says, Who's like the Lord our God, verse 5, who's seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. Your translation might put verse 5 a little bit different from that. But at the least, we see God high above all of us, but paying attention to us, stooping down to see. God has always been worthy of worship, but we know that better than ever, ever since He sent His Son to be among us, to be with us at at eye level. Whenever Joe Torrey, who was a a former Cardinal and and played for some other teams and is a Hall of Famer now, became a manager, Phil Rizzuto from Yankees lore asked Joe, wouldn't Managing a baseball team and a baseball game be done much better from up here in the broadcast booth where we're sitting right now. You see, Joe Torrey had done some of that after his retirement as a player and before he became a manager. And Joe said, no, you need to be right down there in the dugout with them and at the field so they can see you at eye level. God's always been God. He's always been worthy of our worship, but never would people have been able to understand that more than we can since God came down? Since Jesus became one of us, those inhabitants of heaven in the next chapter in Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 12, now are are thinking specifically about Jesus as the Lamb who was slain, the one who by His blood ransomed people for God. Revelation 5 verse 12 says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. When God came down, Jesus Christ lived the kind of life that He lived, died the death for the reason for which he died, was buried and and rose from the dead. Well, from then on, we know about God like a way we never could have before. How loving is this God? He's that loving. How just is this God? He's that just. He loves us so much that, that Jesus would die For our sins, He hates sin so much that Jesus would die for our sins. He's absolutely loving. He's absolutely holy. And the better look we get at Jesus, the better we'll be at worshiping God for all that He is. Verse 7 says that God raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. This psalm teaches us that when we see God right in worship, it changes us. In one way or the other, when we approach God the right way in worship, changes us for the better. Sometimes God responds with a change in our circumstances. Sometimes God affects a change within us whenever we approach Him right in worship. I think about people throughout Scripture whom could be adequately described by words like these in in verses 7 through 9. 
I think about Joseph in the book of Genesis. Joseph loved God from the beginning. But Joseph's brothers didn't love Joseph. And he suffered for it. For a long time, one way and another, he'd be the kind of guy that this psalm would describe as being on the ash heap. But before it was all over, because of Joseph's devotion, his faithful worship to God, God seated him with the princes. He became a prince in Egypt and a savior of his own family. When we read about him giving the barren woman a home in verse 9 and making her the joyous mother of children, we're hearing an almost verbatim echo of the words of praise that Hannah offered to God. When she had prayed and prayed for a son, and she vowed, God, he will be yours if you'll give him to me. And she was blessed with that boy, Joseph, and she did just what she said she would. I think about that woman, Anna, that we meet after Jesus is born in the New Testament in Luke chapter 2. She'd been waiting and waiting and waiting to see the Lord's Messiah. She had been a widow, maybe since she was about 16 or 19 years old. And finally she saw him. And she burst out and praised for him. And in telling other people in the environment of the temple all about Jesus... I think about that woman that Jesus met at Jacob's well in John chapter 4. She had no idea who she was going to meet that day. But by the end for her, it was a very worshipful encounter. And it's in that context of that conversation where Jesus said in John 4, 23 and 24 that God is seeking a certain kind of worshiper, true worshipers. Verse 24, for God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This was a woman who through circumstances and through choices all mixed together had been through lots of men and lots of things in life. She goes back into her village after she's had this instructive and worshipful encounter with Jesus, and she wants to tell everybody about the one who told her everything that she had done. She believed he's the Messiah. She believed he's the one. She helped others to believe. We could think about Saul, who's also known as Paul, and how the Lord changed him. All through the Bible, there are people whose circumstances are changed because they approach God right, or people whose disposition is changed because they approached God right. There's something about worship. When we know who God is, and when we worship Him in the way that He deserves and in the way that He desires. The Bible says something that we could readily apply to ourselves in verse 8, that He raises people up to sit with princes, with the princes of His people. In Ephesians chapter 2, when Paul is extolling the grace of God as the way that we are saved by Him through faith, he said in verse 6 that God has raised us up with Jesus and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're a people who are raised up as well. Worship will change us when it comes out of a devotion to God from true servants of God. I read last week about a father and his son. His son was enrolled in a school for kids with special learning challenges in Brooklyn. One day, they were coming up on a baseball game where some of his schoolmates were playing. And the record of this comes from a a speech that his father gave at a fundraising event for that school. 
Father first uh, shocked the audience when he said, where's the perfection in my son Shia? Everything God does is done with perfection, but my child cannot understand things as other children do. My child cannot remember facts and figures as other children do. Where's God's perfection? Where do we see God at work? Is my son God's creation? Can I worship a God when I have a son like this? Well, the audience was shocked by his question. Then the father said, I believe that when God brings a child like this into the world, the perfection that he seeks is in the way people react to this child. And then he told this story about that baseball game. He and Shia, his son, one afternoon walked past that park where those boys were playing, and Shia asked his dad, do you think they'll let me play? His father knew most boys would not want him on their team, but he understood that if his son were chosen to play, it would give him a comfortable sense of belonging. So he went along with Shia. He approached one of the boys on the field and he asked if Shia could play with them. Well, that boy looked around at his teammates for guidance, didn't get any. But then he said, we're losing by six runs. The game's in the eighth inning. I guess he can be on our team. We'll try to put him up to bat in the ninth inning. Well, Shia was told to put on a glove and go out and play center field. In the bottom of the eighth, his team scored three runs but they were still behind by three then. In the bottom of the ninth, this team scored again. They had two outs. The bases were loaded. Shia was scheduled to be up. Surprisingly, that team captain handed Shia the bat. Everyone knew it was all but impossible because Shia didn't even know how to hold the bat properly, let alone hit a ball with it. But he stepped up to the plate. Pitcher moved a few steps to lob the ball in softly. The pitch came in, and Shia shunned just very clumsily. And he, of course, missed. One of Shia's teammates came up to Shia, and together they held the bat. They faced the pitcher. The pitcher again took a few steps forward to toss the ball softly towards Shia. And lo and behold, he and the other boy together swung the bat and hit the ball. It was a slow roller to the pitcher. The pitcher picked up that soft grounder, and he threw it high and lofted it way over the right fielder's head. Everyone started yelling, Shia, run to first, run to first. Well, never in his life had Shia run to first. He'd never been on a ball field like that, but he scampered down the baseline wide-eyed and startled, and by the time he reached first base, the right fielder had the ball. Well, he could have thrown the ball to the second baseman for an easy out, but he threw it way over the third baseman's head. And everybody started yelling, Shia, run to second, run to second. Well, he ran towards second as the base runners ahead of him circled the bases toward home. And as he reached second base, the opposing shortstop ran to him, turned him in the direction of third base, and he shouted, run to third, run to third. As Shia rounded third, the boys from both teams were behind him screaming, Shia, run home, run home. Shia ran home. He crossed home plate, and all 18 boys, both teams, lifted him on their shoulders and made him the hero as he just hit a a grand slam and won the game for the team. Now, when his father told the story, here's how he ended it in that fundraising speech. That day... And he said this with tears rolling down his face. Those 18 boys reached their level of God's perfection. What does God want to see in people? When people have that Godward attitude, especially when we will come to God and worship the way that we ought to worship Him, God is praised but we're made better. God does not command us to worship because He needs our worship. He commands us to worship because He deserves it, and we need to worship Him. We have that need. 
that helps us to put everything in order in life. We read in the book that many of us are reading in this last week, where Tim also wrote, God is not made any better by our worship. Instead, we are made better and more like Christ through God-centered, God-pleasing worship. There's something about worship. It's something that only, only God deserves. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. He deserves it. And He wants it because we need it. Via our worship, God makes us better. Are you one of God's true worshipers? Only His true worshipers can offer up the worship that He wants in spirit and in truth. Are you one of the Lord's servants? To be a servant of the Lord is to be a disciple of Christ. And that means that we deny ourselves, we take up our cross and follow Him. Jesus told His disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. This morning, are you one of His disciples? Are you one of His servants? Are you one of His eager worshipers? Are you allowing God to change your life through your obedience to the things that He tells you to do? Can you look forward to being a part of that worshiping throng that's been pictured in the book of Revelation forever? This morning should be the day if you've not become a disciple of Jesus, if you've not been saved from your sins. Why would you let that wait? If you are a disciple but you're one who's falling, one who's fallen. I hope that something about our worship today has helped to pick you up. But if you would benefit, and you know it from our prayer on your behalf to God, as you're penitent, as you're seeking His help, we would love the privilege of getting to pray for you. This is an invitation to obey the gospel. If you'd like to do that, we're inviting you to come to the front while we stand and sing the song. Ah.